Hi everybody, International Master David Proust here with uh, week five's professional chess lesson from the Pro Chess League. Um, this week's lesson is for you and for me because uh, you know I picked out these two instructive rook endgames and I thought that the lesson was A and then I looked at them and the lesson was actually B which was completely different than A. So um, uh, let's uh, let's just get into this and learn some stuff about rook endings because this is pretty awesome. Um, the first example I have here for you is um, from Sarich uh, for the uh, Chess Bras, who scored three and a half out of four and won this nice rook and pawn end game against Shimonov. Now, uh, in this position here, here's how Sarich converted. He played e4 hoping to get space in the center for his king if black trades on e4. And then here he surprised me by pushing his d-pawn and making a pass pawn over there. Uh, second pass pawn. Black plays king e5, getting great activity and position for his king. That's what white's given up by playing d5. Um, he pushes pass with this pawn, sacks the pawn on e4. I was like, whoa, this is revolutionary, insane stuff. This is how you win a rook and pawn ending? Black um, makes his H pawn his counterplay. White uses the two pawns. Uh, D8 queen is threatened, so black can't take the A pawn. And here comes the A pawn. And uh, black lost in another move to white playing A8 equals queen. So amazing and shocking. So let me tell you what I learned when I looked at it. First, what I thought we were going to learn from this was that sometimes you can't get your king in, and what you need to do to win a position with one pass pawn is make a second pass pawn. My general understanding of how basically all endgames work, including rook and pawn endings, uh, is that if you're the side with one advantage, be it like a pass pawn or a majority or something, um, so a significant advantage, and you're trying to force a win with that, what you usually need to do to win is you need to get your king active. Your king either needs to find its way over here to break the blockade of the A pawn and like support the A pawn in winning, or your king needs to somehow maneuver his way in to attack a second weakness of the opponents, or you know, he could come into this area to attack this pawn. But that was kind of my like general thinking of how almost all endgames work, is at some point your king needs to get into the position. And if you've ever seen endgames where it's kind of like locked up and there's no route in for the king, a lot of those endgames end up being a draw, even if you're up a pawn um, or even two. If a king simply can't get in, it's hard to convert an endgame without, without that king's final presence. Obviously, like with everything with almost everything in chess, there are exceptions to that. But that was my general understanding. So I thought, wow, I was I was wrong about this. Sarge doesn't get his king in, and he doesn't even keep the black king out. What he does is he makes a second pass pawn, lets the black king get the better position um, at this point here, right? Lets the black king get the better position and sacks a pawn in order to get a second pass pawn. And the way he wins is off of this like two pass pawn thing. And you'll see that in the, uh, in the second example I'm going to show you is very, very similar to this. So I thought like, wow, this is going to be this like startling insight that the way you win rook and pawn endings, that a second avenue to do that is to create a second pass pawn instead of using sort of the normal approach that I suggested to you. But let's go back for a second and ask ourselves if the normal approach would have been wrong. So in my understanding of the normal approach in a position like this, one thing is you want this pass pawn as far up the board as possible. Because every time it gets closer, the black rook has less and less ability to move when you've got this great rook behind your pass pawn. You want to get it up the board as far as possible. Because anytime the black rook moves, right, things are closing in on him. The walls are shutting. And, you know, now he can't move at all unless it's with check because of white queening. Okay? So... My thought is first you want to do this. Okay, so black will basically like mark time now. And now my thought is, well, I can always waste time with my rook. Uh, the black rook can't move every time it moves, right? So now it's just his king against mine, but I can always gain the opposition with some with some rook move. So now I would play e4 now that the black king is backed up. And I would think that now if black takes, right, it's very easy for me. My king comes up. His king has to back up now or 
right? He could do this to wait a move, but eventually his king has to has to back up. So his king's going to have to, you know, concede something. Either it's going to go this way and concede the king side, or it's going to go this way and concede the queen side, right? And now I'm getting my king in to uh, break this blockade, or using the second pass pawn, as I was learning this week. So that would be my normal understanding of how this might work. So on e4, black can try and make things harder by keeping his king in the area for a bit, but it doesn't really make things harder, actually, when I... When I looked at this again, you just trade on f5, right? And then you just do your trick where you move your rook. And he's got he's to concede stuff, right? Again, if the rook moves a7. So, you know, his king comes back, we come forward. Could have also come to e4, would also win, right? Something like this. It's another way to win. Right? And you can recognize how this is winning. Again, we just sort of two-tongued the black king. Um... And then eventually he had to step out of the good areas. Um, so actually, my basic idea of how to win this position would actually have been a very easy way to win it. In fact, probably easier than the way Sarich took, the route that Sarich took. I think actually just A6, tightening the screws on this rook. And I mean, my approach, you don't have to calculate anything longer than maybe like one or two moves along it's pretty simple there's like no counterplay no danger it's actually quite a good approach so i was surprised to find that my normal idea was actually okay so how about the approach that he took with e4 rook a2 king f6 d5 again there's no reason that he had to push actually as fast as he did um you know he could again spend a tempo on like his rook um or he could play, I was thinking also maybe king e3. But anyway, he goes for d5. The point of king e3 would be so this wouldn't be checked later. But okay, he goes for d5. Let's see how good his approach actually was. King e5. So here I was looking at another possible defense for black, which would be to trade first. It's a little bit surprising. But the point is that by making that trade of the c pawn for the e pawn, I was going to have to make that trade anyway as black. Now my king's in contact with these pass pawns and... Importantly, I've got this three-on-one clear majority that can create counterplay. So, um, yeah, so basically, I looked at this endgame for a while, this weird one that we have here, and ultimately I found that potentially white could still win it. But I, to me, it seemed a lot. It seemed a lot trickier than this one. So I'll just show you guys one variation to show you why to me this seems a little bit trickier. I played rook a4 before king e3 to avoid g4 from black, but it's eventually going to come anyway. Bring the king up, um, and maybe you can see why this feels a little risky or complicated to me. Like something could potentially have gone wrong in this line. Um, here, if rook g2, rook d6, check is a draw, basically. So you have to go for this rook c4 check, rook c5, get a queen and play queen versus rook. Um, so anyway, just to give you a flavor of how tricky that could have been. And also in the way the game went, where he goes d6, check, king here, g4 takes, h3, d7, rook eight, rook d2, rook d8, a6. In this position, the move king e6 is kind of pointless since black can never actually play rook takes d7. This simply allows white to play moves like king e4 or to keep going with a7 like Sarge did in one. So the more testing move would be like h2, rook takes h2, rook takes d7, right? And um, again, I thought white can still win with rook h5 check, king f6, and taking this pawn. And um, if black goes to a7, white has rook h6, check rook c6. So white still wins. And king g6 to stop rook h6, my line goes like this. White gets back, defends the pawn. He's now up two pawns, and he can win this endgame without any more adventures or trouble. But to me, actually looking at this more, Sarge's approach looked a little bit more risky and messy than my sort of baseline approach. There was a little bit more to calculate. Um, and it was concrete. So now let's look at the second one. This one here is Parimarjan Negi as white against Xu Xiangyu of the Chess Pandas. 
They've just traded a bunch of pieces, and here I was very impressed with this move from Nagy, rook a5. Not eating the pawn that's right in front of him, but instead preferring to eat this pawn on c5 while defending his c-pawn and tying black to passivity by attacking c7. Brilliant, right? What a sweet idea. Um, so black starts bringing his king in. He grabs this pawn. Black's passive. Now white's up a pawn. And he hasn't yet turned it into a pass pawn, but this two-on-one advanced strong majority is kind of like the first advantage for white. So now the second thing that white would do would be what? It would be to bring his king in here, right? In my standard approach, it would be to bring his king over this way, um, keep the black rook passive with the right white rook for the meantime, right, by attacking these things, bring the king in, and either make this into a pass pawn or win a second pawn over here with the king. Okay? Not the approach that Pari uses. Again, so rook c6, tying the rook here, a4, a5. All right, the black rook's kind of like stuck in here. But now Pari plays confusing move, g5. What is that doing? Nailing something on the king side? I don't know. F4, what is he up to? H4, just okay. So now black's ready to maybe, you know, allow some variation where white goes after this A5 pawn and black just activates his rook, right? Because now his rook's active, the black king has centralized while the white king just sat on G2, like countered it, all my basic tenets of, of rook and pawn endings. So, um, so black's kind of getting ready to, to come out and mess things up, even if he has to sack the A pawn. So Pari plays f5 and reveals that his idea was widening the 6th rank. You usually see this principle with widening the 7th rank, but it's equally applicable here that he's increasing the scope of this strong rook by sacking this pawn. And he's also improving this h pawn. He's made a second pass pawn. Now, compared to the Sarge example, this 2-on-1 isn't yet a pass pawn, but I hope you see the similarity that it's like he's got this thing that's basically a potential pass pawn, and now he's making a second pass pawn elsewhere instead of activating his king, right? His king is still just sitting here sort of controlling the squares from which the black rook might want to get behind and deal with this. And suddenly this pawn's running, and if black runs the king back over here to deal with it, then Pari could probably use a winning plan of c5, d6, right? So it could use that sort of like two-pass pawn idea again that we just saw from Sarge. So, um, yeah, so these two positions kind of rhyme for me. Um, Xu Shang Yu gets his rook behind the H pawn, which comes forward anyway. And um, now finally, Pari Marjan is going to activate his king. Again, I'm like, wow, this is like shockingly complicated, right? He's allowing this counterplay. He's got this rook sack and... You know, in fact, it's very clear that his two pass pawns are going to beat the rook and win this end game. But again, I was impressed. Wow, that was concrete. If you look at this position um, back here, you would never think that the winning plan for white is to queen the H pawn, would you? I mean, I guess like if you're a 2600 GM who for some reason is watching my video, um, you would, but I don't know why anyone that good would watch my videos. Um, but for the rest of us, like, this is not a logical guess, right, that the H-pawn is going to win it. You would think bringing the king. So once again, I I was sort of like assuming like Pari's this great genius. I've seen him win like, I saw him win three rook endgames in one night, okay? So he won three rook endgames in four games this day. So you got to take his rook endgame skills pretty seriously. Um, so I sort of assumed like he's a genius. This is the new gospel. Everything I thought before is wrong. But when I re-examined this, Again, it was like more complicated and pretty concrete. So first, um, let's go back here and examine my first idea, which is this move is genius. You shouldn't take the pawn on a6 because if you take the pawn on a6, then after rook b4, rook c6, rook takes c4, rook takes c7, the position is messy, right? Basically, whites let the black rook get unpassive and allowed a bunch of trades. So you still have a one pawn advantage like in the rook a5 to c5 line. But now black has chances to trade his c pawn for either your a or your d pawn, right? And one more pawn trade, and then then what? Then you're getting into that zone of like rook end games that you can't really win. So the black king comes to f8 here and here. And now, you know, it's worrisome that black could follow up with rook d4, rook a4, something like that, and somehow hold this end game. But I discovered a little detail. Um, white can actually improve on that whole line dramatically by throwing this check, 
which sends the black king into very bad position to deal with the d-pawn, right? And then essentially, I want to play the same line that you just saw, where I trade these pawns. But now, how does black deal with this d-pawn, right? It's premature to go rook d4, rook takes c5, and be down two pawns. So, actually, this approach is probably totally winning for white. No problems at all. Um, you know, next, white could bring his king up to support to support this stuff. Um, he's also threatening rook f7. And if black king comes to defend it, I think this move again is very smart, chasing him back here and then play g5, just sort of like saying, hey, you're stuck in here. And I'm pretty convinced that this is a winning position for white, and I'm not going to analyze it much further for you. But suffice it to say, if black plays f6, I'm not even taking it. I'll just let him take on g5 himself and get three pawns here. And his king still can't get out. So, um, yeah, so actually this kind of like much more basic approach could have potentially been enough to just win this endgame as well because of this important detail, rook a8. Without this, I don't think it's a good approach. But okay, still certainly nothing wrong with this first thing that Pari does because he's keeping more pawns on the board and keeping the more active rooks. So this should, should certainly be good. But then, okay, let's see how good or bad the normal approach would be, right? My normal approach in the Sarich game turned out to be good. So my normal approach would be I would go here so that this guy is not moving. To, so that there's just no rook to b7 immediately. Just, well, I can prove to you that there's no rook b7 because I'm taking the pawn in time, coming back to defend this, and taking this. And then I've got, you know, the self-propelled duo of past pawns there. So on rook c5, he's going to have to bring his king in range of the c pawn if he wants to free his rook. I'll start bringing my king up. When he does this, I'll actually come to b5 instead of back to c6. So I'm tying the rook passively to the pawn that the king couldn't get to to defend. So I'm still keeping that rook kind of passive. And if c6, white has rook b6. So I'm going to keep bringing in my king. And my plan is, you know, king here, king here. Right? And start bringing my king in to help with my point of strength here, then switch the rook and I can put my king on b5 and win the a pawn. Um, and yeah, I mean, for example, here I play rook b3, just stop that counterplay. I'm going to play rook f3 at some point to bring the black king this way, and my king will come in and win the game. And as far as I could tell, my basic approach would also win. If black ever plays f6 to deal with my rook f3, then I'll put my rook on e3, and then I can play c5, c6 check because of king d6, rook e6 mate. Uh, maybe that's too much to, to just say, so let's, let's show it. I'm marking time for black, I play c5, marking time for black, c6. And the point is black can't come up because this is checkmate. So I'm able to push these pawns in this odd way, get the king back here, come forward, and now I've just got so much space, right? I can sort of dominantly push d6 and king here, or come here, or work the king around here, etc. So, basic lesson, I think actually the normal approach of just tying the black rook to the a pawn and then centralizing the king should be enough for white to win as well. Well, then how good by comparison was Pari's approach? He plays g5, and he's letting the opponent's rook out at this point, right? On... Um, well, actually, I found that, again, like with Sarge's approach, I think that this is a little bit risky, and it gives black some chances to muddy things up, and white has to calculate more and be more accurate, I think, to try and play the endgame this way. After f5, um, gf5, h5, I'm just, again, going to give one variation as an example of a possibly better defense for black that would make things a little bit tricky. It seems like what black needs to do is get back here and defend the h-pawn. That's 100% true, but in the game, the way he does it, he has no counterplay. Like, he doesn't take out any of white's pawns and ends up behind here on the h-pawn. Well, not no counterplay. He's got the f-pawn. But it, it turns out to not be enough. And actually, he's got just time to grab this pawn and then get back and stop the h-pawn. So that's what he needs to do. We play h6, takes, takes, grab the pawn, h7. I know, it looks like it's just queening. But now rook a2 check. And king g3, I will have f4 distracting with this pawn and the king can't stay on h2, right? He's got to take this, and then the rook comes here. And black deals with it, and he's got this. So um, so he saves the game, <laughs> I think. So 
basically in this rook before line, I struggled to figure out how white was going to try and, and win this position here. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have to go to h7. I can keep the pawn somewhere where it's defended so that so that the rook coming behind here, for example, wouldn't like win the pawn. But the problem is that in this variation, black has the A pawn. That's the sort of big difference. So he's taking the time to make that a pass pawn. Uh, I didn't see how white could win this end game here. And if there is a way for white to win, I would still argue that this was actually harder to win than the approach where you just tie the black rook to the A pawn, centralize your king, and then go about coming up with the winning plan. So... I don't know. It's interesting that two such strong endgame players, I mean, Sarge and Pari are both very strong endgame players. They each use the same kind of different approach to rook endings that shocked me, where they're trying to make the second pass pawn instead of doing the whole like active passive rook and king thing that, that, that most of us would know about is like the first thing you learn about a rook endgame is like there's material advantage, there's rook activity, there's king activity. Ideally, you want all three, but two of them is usually enough to win, and what you're looking for is to continually gain whichever one you don't have. So if you've got a pass pawn, what you want is the rook activity and the king activity. So they they both sort of challenged that approach to playing the rook endgame and made the second pass pawn approach, and I was like, wow, that's so rocking my world. But after examining it some more, it looks like the good old-fashioned keep them passive with your rook, bring your king up, and then look for your second target might be just as good as this as this new stuff. So um, I hope that's of interest to you. You can play around with both of these uh, positions uh, yourself if you like. Um, you know, you can you can even paste in these positions and drill them in uh, in chess.com against the computer in the uh, drill tool and um, and see what you think about this. I'm happy to hear your own thoughts and conclusions and discuss this further about how to play these, these Rook end games. And uh, I'll see you in uh, week six for more Pro Chess League action, live shows on Tuesday and Thursday all day long, and um, then more highlights and lessons uh, in the next weekend. All right, take care, everybody. Bye.